And welcome, Ooh. ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, the head of Arcane Inc., spelled with a K, not with a C., and the the a long time a long time writer of of science fiction and fa and fantasy of all shapes and sizes and now breaking and now breaking into the realm of tabletop with the upcoming Titan home the one and only Ray Clark how are you doing today or tonight great <laughs> fantastic I wish you would have told me to to, to bring a beverage um, <laughs> I would have had to. <laughs> I'd have had to go pick something up. See, I like to drink um, Irish whiskey, but I drank it all, so I don't have any in the house right now. So I'm ill prepared for this. I'll just say, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that you're drinking coffee, and you'll have, and you'll be close enough. <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now, when now, um, a bit of a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings. So. Walk me through, if you don't mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it um, stick? Okay, yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of got started a little bit late. Um, I know most of my high school friends that I still talk to, the, the guys anyway, they, they've played in high school, but, um, you know, it was a little bit awkward in high school, uh, inviting a girl to the table. And so I didn't really make it to the, um, TTRPG table until college. Mm -hmm. So some friends in college started playing and we basically, we started this campaign and we got together every single week and it was a big, big table. I want to say we had like eight or 10 people, oh, um, this I know it was a lot. So I really got kind of just thrown in, but there were plenty of people there that were willing to help. And that was mm -hmm. great. Um, and so I picked it up really well and I had a lot of fun with it. And it ended up being this just enormous, epic campaign. And I, I think we ended up going to like level 18 or something. So, I mean, I think that's the highest, my very first campaign was probably like the highest level. I think I've had a campaign go in a, in as far as I can remember. So that's kind of how I got started. So mm -hmm. now with, now would you, would you say that the, that the bulk of your um, TR, TRPG experience was through, was through um, the D20 system or over the years did you branch, did you dip into um, other ponds? Uh, most of my experience, I started out with second edition there, um, mm -hmm. whenever I was in college. Um, and I think I played some third level by that time, things started to kind of break apart, um, or third edition. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I kind of ended up, you know, life kind of happens and I kind of got away from it for a little while. And then I've uh, come back to the space for uh, fifth edition, mm -hmm. which I really enjoy. I do kind of dabble in Pathfinder and Shadowrun, um, some fantasy age uh, mm -hmm. here and there. So I do like to try other things because I know, um, you know, D20 system isn't the only thing out there, but uh, mm -hmm. it seems to be you know, something that I always gravitate to. Yeah. Um, well, since you mentioned Shadowrun, I have to get one bad joke out of my system. How many pounds of Go six ciders it. do you have? What? How, How many, many pounds? <laughs> yeah, pounds. Boy, I don't know. I don't. I can't say that I've weighed them. <laughs> I have a lot, though. Well, I, I figured you'd have a lot because, because when it, um, the unwritten rule whenever Shadowrun gets brought to the table is, okay, three pounds minimum. I know it seems like that. Um, I so, couldn't even tell you, and I have the I have the small ones, and then I have a whole bunch of the you know the regular size ones too. Um, so if you put all those together, yeah, there there's quite a bit there, and I always keep a little bit extra in case we have an impromptu game and somebody forgot to bring their um, bag of d sixes, and so I have everything there for, for whoever might need it. I um I've had a rule of ins of inspecting everybody's everybody's bag of dice. Um, Large, um, largely to make sure that no that nobody ends up doing cursed dice because you're probably familiar with that little superstition. 
about using other people's dice. Yeah. Um, the only uh-huh. thing, the only thing is, I any sort of any sort of chainmail, any sort of chainmail um, dice bag is not allowed. Interesting. Because what's the reasoning behind that? Because some because one of my players' significant others um, got got in an argument got in an argument near the table, threw the threw threw a chainmail bag of dice and it got hit and it hit me in the face. Ouch! It's not the okay. worst thing I've been hit. It's not the worst thing I've been hit with. But um, I'd figure if I'm gonna if I'm gonna get hit with something, which Murphy's law dictates will eventually happen, I'd rather I'd rather it be I'd rather it be something not made of metal. Um, I would agree. Yeah, but with that, <laughs> with that, in, with that in mind, what, when it came to um, Titanholm, which seem seems to be now, maybe I'm wrong on this, but from what I'm seeing of Titanholm, it seems it's this um, amalgamation of elements of post-apocalypse and steampunk. Yes. Um. What was the spark for this kind of thing? Was it something that was built off of um, previous campaigns and sessions that you had, that you had done, or was there a different route? Well, I had a series of adventures that I had prepared in a different setting um, for a game company, and I ran those at uh, at Gen Con, mm-hmm. and they were all things that I had created because I had to go off book because they kind of, we ran, there wasn't any more material for me to continue running the game. So I just started, you know, making shit up because why not? Um, Oh, that's the secret of the business. Right. I'm like, well, there's nothing here. So I'm just going to point to this place on the map and say it's this and, and just go from there. Mm -hmm. Um, So I kind of had this, off world that was kind of within this world, but not really. Um, and I had all these adventures already laid out and I kind of had hoped I was like, well, if I could just use them in that same setting and realm, um, and the system, but uh, they weren't doing a gaming license for that. So I was like, well, I'll just take it and change it and tweak it. And it, you know, I added in some, technology and kind of a post-apocalyptic kind of feel to it. And, and uh, that was kind of the uh, Frankenstein monster that I ended up creating and converting all of those adventures over to um, the D20 system. Mm-hmm. So now when it, when it came to, when it came to the conversion was, was it a, um, was it a relatively seamless conversion or were there some parts where, where um, you had to essentially nuke a part of it and, and rebuild in order to fit, I had to nuke quite a bit of it and 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 fix a lot of it. So, um, but the bare bones, you know, of the adventure is there. Uh, you know, most of the story. Uh, what I had to do is go through. You know, you got to pick out new new monsters and new stat blocks and make sure that wherever the characters are and their level progression that, you know, you pick a, an adequate uh, challenge for them. That's not, you know, you don't want to have TPK, but at the same time you want it to be challenging enough that it makes the game fun. So mm-hmm. just making sure that I have the right encounter at the right moment for the right level type of thing um, going through that was most of the work because the story was already there, you know? Um, so I kind of had to build the world, uh, had to change a little bit of the story to make it fit with the, with the new world. But, you know, the bare bones, you know, beginning, middle and end of the story pretty much was, was already there. So that's, you know, what makes an adventure is the, the adventure, the journey of getting from beginning to end. So Mm-hmm. That's kind of how that came about. Yeah. Now, with that, now with that in mind, of all of all these of all these sort of genres that can that can go with, because there's no there's no shortage of um, genres just within um, fantasy alone. Um. Why why that why this particular co- combination of um of steampunk and post apocalypse. 
Well, it was the it was the world build, and as I, I was as I was building it, and I wanted this I wanted this technology to exist in this world, but I didn't want people to really understand how it worked or how to use it. I kind of wanted that to be a mystery. So in order for me to do that, I was like, well, let's say there's been this apocalypse here on this world, and the world has pretty much been raised to the ground, destroyed, and um, it's kind of rebuilt on the ruins of the old civilization. And so the people in this new civilization, you know, they're finding and salvaging these relics from the past that are technology and they're trying to kind of reverse engineer them, figure out how they're how they work, um, kind of tinker with them. So they kind of fix them up and maybe they work close to how they were originally engineered or maybe they're changed and slightly altered, but I kind of wanted to be that kind of weird in the middle. They have the technology, but just don't really know how it works and then mix magic in with it. And um, I thought that that added a pretty neat element to the world and that you could have either a magic user or you could have this um, kind of tinker engineer character, you know, who could have a, a blaster of some time type or some kind of a, a grenade that they could throw. And I just kind of thought that was, I thought that was an interesting element to add to the world. Mm -hmm. Now with that, now with that in, with that in mind, you're, you're setting this up as a, um, when it came now, when it came to, when it came to that particular uh, approach with the, um, with the ma with the magic or rather magic tech ab approach with it, would you would you say that it would have more in common with um, the way technology is used in something like Numenera, where people know how to use it but they don't know how it works? Yeah, kind of similar to that. Mm -hmm. I would say. And in in that reg in that regard, since this is um, I, now I'm assume since it's written as an OG, as an OGL um setting, I'm assume I'm assuming that it's designed to be um five E compatible. Correct. Um, in that in that regard, are there are there any race class combinations you can think of that might be a little trickier to implement within Titan Holmes um established setting? Um, actually, uh, one of the <laughs> interesting things about this was um, in order for me to make it work really well and because I had designed the world to kind of be morally ambiguous, meaning that there is no alignment in this realm. It's kind of that post post apocalyptic, you know, there really is no right or wrong. There's really nobody steering the ship. You know, there are cities that have loose um, structures but there's there's no real nations there's no i mean it is kind of in in turmoil um so there's really no good evil kind of alignment it's kind of every man woman and child for themselves but the other thing um th that was interesting that i had i did was i actually um the race ability modifiers um i got rid i wouldn't say i got rid of them i moved them I moved those to the actual player classes that kind of align with the different classes, um, which I think players will, will really, really enjoy um, some of the pluses that, you know, I gave some of the character classes. So you could really, it doesn't really matter what race that you play. So you can really play whatever race that you want. So mm -hmm. if you want to be an orc cleric or a halfling barbarian, you can be something crazy like that because the world is designed based on your background. So if you're an orc and you grow up in a tribe and you know, your father is a, was the shaman of your village uh, before you. And so you have learned all of this healing and all of these spells, you know, you can play that. You don't have to play the beefy fighter as that particular race. And so it kind of opens up the window for you to be able to play whatever race you want with whatever class. 
Um, that also opened the idea. I had added a player class called a remnant. Um, and really the only way that that works is if race doesn't play a part. And so the remnant is basically like a, an Android machine, but it looks just like a regular person, but it could be a dwarf. It could be an elf. It could be an orc. It can be, you know, it could be any race or species, but underneath it's a machine. And so it has its own different kind of abilities there. So when I was trying to figure out how am I going to make that work if it can look like anything, but then it has different abilities than that particular race would have. So I had to make it a class. So um, I would say this setting is really, really easy to be able to play whatever you, race you want with whatever class because I've pretty much eliminated any of those problems. You can play yeah. whatever kind of character you want with a, whatever race you want. Mm -hmm. Now, when it now when it comes to the um, when it com when it comes to doing a a um, post apocalypse style style approach. Um, mm -hmm. was there, was there ever the, was there ever the consideration about, um, about do, about, um, make, about doing hex crawls in this particular setting? Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see you, you could definitely do hex crawls pretty easily here, especially with all of these, like, ruined settings and, and, and there's definitely, um, there's definitely a possibility for a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, now, of course, when it comes, when it comes to the regions, I def, I, um, when I, when I look at the regions that are described, I definitely get a vibe of, um, strangeness was, was the aim for, was the aim for a lot of them to, be let be um when you're outside when you're outside of say ruined cities to have to have a sort of weird kind of um art not architecture but landscape with the areas yeah there's some interesting landscape in titan home and that comes from so basically the 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 world was destroyed by basically mm -hmm. a cataclysmic event it's kind of a cosmic event meteorite whatever you want to you want to call it um the their kind of lore is, you know, each, there's a bunch of different stories on what people thought that it was. Um, and this cataclysmic event pretty much gave birth to the gods that, that live on Titan home as well. Um, there's major gods and then there's also minor gods that kind of, I guess, arrived on the tails of this meteorite that, that struck Titan home. Um, the meteorite itself kind of scarred the land and in particular where it struck the land is called the glasslands. Mm -hmm. um, and basically it struck in the middle of a desert and it struck with such intense heat that it turned all of the sand to glass. And so instead of having, um, you know, these sandstorms, you would have these glass storms where, you know, like these particles of glass as the wind is blowing kind of cut, they could cut you as you're walking through it. So a lot of people um, don't travel to the glass lands, but it's also considered the holy land because that is where the meteorite struck. And so that was kind of the origin of the gods in Titan home. Mm -hmm. And also believed to be the source of magic, which brought their um, their crystal uh, Voltrum, which they use as a battery-like substance. So they've they've kind of retrofitted the relic technology to run off of this crystal um, that is a result of this striking meteorite, which is called Voltrum. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes when now, when it comes to the when it comes to the um, high gods, which is mentioned that there are um, five of them, mm -hmm. um, what can you tell me about each and what their um, domains might lean towards? Uh, the domains for the high gods are very much the um, the main elements. So you've got earth, air, fire, and water, 
And then the fifth one, I always like to have it. I just, I love to put it shadow, mm -hmm. you know, just for that uh, kind of ambiance, I guess, if you want to say. But those are the five um, major gods. Uh, the, I believe it's the, let me think about this. I got to remember which one it is, which God, one of the gods. It might be, I'll have to look it up. I can't even remember <laughs> which one, it, what, which one it was now. There's so many of them. Mm -hmm. Um, but basically her, her job is to, um, basically protect Titan home from any other like meteoric attacks or whatever um, to try and uh, keep the people safe. So um, quite a few people worship her and hope that she, uh, she wins her fight and, and saves them all. But um, yeah, each of the, of the high gods definitely have a, a job on Titan home. There are lesser gods that seem to walk among um, the people of Titan home uh, they have their own realms, but they like to kind of commingle with the people of Titan Home. So um, you could walk by them on the street and not even realize it. Mm -hmm. um, like when, when, whenever I, th whenever I hear lesser gods, the um, one of the one of the main things that always comes to mind is, um, say, the petty gods within um, a game like Exalted. Where yeah. they're where they're either either they represent some some region some some area, um, and are and are tend to be very fo tend to be very hyper focused on their particular area and their and their particular logic, and I use logic in the biggest mm -hmm. air quotes possible. <laughs> oh, of course, yes. Um, you mean they have blinders on to everything else? <laughs> air quotes yeah 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 but if you yeah but it's it's it but if you step but they'll scream bloody murder if you step on the wrong branch in their in their forest kind of thing uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um aka re, aka yet another reason why you never ever trust elves ever <laughs> um so the lesser gods um, yeah, they can be, I mean, obviously they're focused on, you know, whatever their, um, central power, uh, comes from or whatever their realm is. Um, but at the same time, I've kind of set it up as all of those gods kind of squabble with one another in kind of a, they're always, um, trying to undermine each other constantly. Oh, so, oh, so the so, Roman handshake. Some of them are. Yes. So some of them are bigger shit stirrers than the other ones, but um, for the most part, I mean, they have a lot of power and they and they know it, yep. kind of thing. I w I will ad I will admit that when I saw the Crystal Lake region, I immediately said, "Nope." If an if anybody co if anybody walks in if anybody um walks in with a hockey mask, I'm banning you from the table. <laughs> The only reason I say that is because some, is because some um some pranksters in Minnesota actually put a statue of Jason in the bottom of a lake. Oh my god. <laughs> now, well, it's not the same Crystal Lake, but <laughs> Hmm. Now, you meant obviously this. Obviously, this place is is going to be a place that has a whole has a whole lot of the cosmic crystals. And yeah. what I'm what I'm curious about when it comes to those crystals is how how accurate would it be? How similar or different would they be to a kind of magic battery? That's kind of what they are. Um, in essence, I mean, uh, there's. I guess like magical veins running mm -hmm. through these mountains now from this meteorite strike. It's kind of how I picture it. And so then these crystals grow and yeah, they are, they're kind of, they're like little magic batteries. And so I, you know, it'd be, I'm getting really creative with like, well, what, 
what are all the things that I can do with this magic battery? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the possibilities are endless there. You get really creative with that. Yeah. I was, so I, was I guess going I see a lot of room this, this to yeah. grow. I was going to reference Tiberium, but I get the feeling that um, harvesting these crystals is a lot safer than harvesting something like Tiberium. Correct. Yeah. No, it's not that difficult. Mm -hmm. Or or that dangerous to get too close to it. Or right. that willing to screw over the environment. Um, right. Now when, it now, when it comes to... Um, when it, the thing that I the thing that I noticed when it came to the um, art shown for um, Fortune's Coast is mm -hmm. is the fact that the you have a you have a character who seems to who seems to be all gillied up, but the gillies end up looking like electronic circuits. Yeah. Um, is that is is that a um is that sort of um, improvisation with technology, a, a common fixture with the setting? Yes. All right, I can de I can definitely uh, see I can definitely see that. Now, it does talk it does talk about um uh, now obviously we we mentioned the we mentioned the whole thing of racial modifiers getting um sh getting shuffled around so so that races aren't playing at as t as much type as um before. But Correct. when it com when it comes to when it comes to classes, what I'm what would be what would be some major changes from how classes would would work in vanilla? In vanilla, okay. Mm -hmm. So in Titan Home and vanilla, gosh, I wish I had all my notes with me. So you get you you get your ability modifiers, and they are the ones like for the class that would be most beneficial to the class. So if mm -hmm. you're a, let me pick, if you're a rogue, you know, you're going to get pluses. I think you get plus two to Dex and plus one to, um, I can't think of this. I think it might be strength mm -hmm. um, and so on and so forth, depending on the class, because it, it kind of plays into the strengths of the class. Because if you think if you're that class, your background is, is that you've worked on that for several years before you've gotten to the to where to where you are. Mm -hmm. So those are the pluses. And then I kind of took some of the um, other racial abilities and added those where they seem to fit. So let me try and think of how, I wish I had my notes with me so that I could explain it better because I could tell you exactly um, what they were. But um, so say for example, you have um, the uh, Dragonborn, the breath weapon, okay? Well, instead of the breath weapon, I gave the sorcerer kind of the same thing, mm -hmm. but he has some kind of like a, a arcane device that emits something similar, like a um, like a cone of fire or something like that. Or I gave the um, I think I gave the luck ability that the halfling had to the rogue. Or maybe I gave it to the bard. I can't remember. But I basically took those extra abilities and divvied them up to the player classes um, that seem to stay in line with those particular classes and would actually enhance them so that they would make sense. So you still get some of those extra perks. They're just dealt out a little bit differently. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so they're still there. Mm -hmm. They're just in a different place yeah now of course it's also noted that you've got that um there's going to be a new a new set of um skills and i'm get i'm guessing that with each of the class entries it'll it'll know which of these um those classes um can have proficiency in when it comes to these new skills Correct. Mm -hmm. as we have so we there's going to be a lot of new skills you're going to have, you know, you're going to have to have blaster pistols because you're going to have those type of weapons. Um, there is new kind of uh, tech armor. Um, so there'll be proficiencies for that. 
uh, skills like engineering, computers, um, driving, because there'll be vehicles, um, uh, piloting, because there'll be airships, you know, so there are a lot of new skills and certain classes will be proficient in certain, certain skills. Yes. Yeah. Um, now when, whenever, 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 um, ranged weapons are, are, in, are introduced in a setting that ha that has melee weapons as well there's all there's always the question of whether or not um the former is going to over is going to overtake the latter in terms of usefulness has yeah. that has that been an issue when it came, when it came to play testing um you i do have to be careful with it cuz i you know the, to make sure that those are are balanced because I don't want it to end up to be like the melee weapons are just pretty much ineffective mm -hmm. with the blaster weapons. Um, the great thing that I can do is that since they don't know how to use the technology to, you know, correctly, um, especially with the grenades and I'm, I'm tweaking, like there are, you can mess up throwing a grenade and actually, you know, oops, I dropped it at my feet or I didn't activate it correctly. And um, you can blow yourself up basically, you know, <laughs> cause yourself damage. So mm -hmm. there are some downfalls to that. And it kind of backs that off a little bit to keep it in line. They're not as easy. You know, I don't just point and shoot kind of, there's a little bit more finesse going on there um, than just, you know, point and pull the trigger kind of thing. So, um, and especially since they're messing with technology that they don't 100% understand, there is that possibility of failure, which hopefully nerfs that a little bit um, to balance out melee weapons with um, the ranged weapons. Mm -hmm. But there are also um, melee weapons that can be imbued with this technology as well. So you could have an electrified blade or um, a, a flamethrower kind of thing. So you could still have a melee type weapon um, that has the technology with it that should make things pretty interesting and even that out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, guess, I'm guessing when it, when it comes to some of those weapons, there's always the risk of... Um, of the technology backfi backfiring and them, um, in the case of, say, a firearm, potentially somebody losing their hand. Sure. Now that is it could happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, now when it comes when it comes to when it comes to cybernetics, now obvi obviously, now you and I, you and I are both familiar both familiar with some of the um, shenanigans that happened with Shadowrun, so. You're le so yeah. you're likely familiar with the uh, limiting factor that um, Shadowrun likes to do with cyberware. Mm -hmm. um, I I e for, ev for every piece of cyberware you lose a bit of essence, lose all of it, and you're basically a zombie. Um, when it comes to when it comes to cyber when it comes to um, cybernetics within this game, mm -hmm. um, what aside from the aside from the fact that again people are messing with technologies that they don't fully understand, what is the catch if somebody wants to go with these kind of enhancements? Well, first off, they're not exactly cheap. Number one, so it makes them a little bit harder. So everybody isn't going to be running around with cybernetics and mm -hmm. and become overpowered. Um, the other thing is, I tried to to limit that you don't get crazy pluses for cybernetics, you get a little bit, it's almost the same as having a magical weapon, you know, oh, I get a plus something to my, my strength modifier or something, maybe a, a one or two, it's not going to be stackable into infinity where you get this overpowered character. I kind of made it more like a, a, a magic, I kind of thought of it like a magic weapon, you know, mm -hmm. like you're enhancing something. So it's like wearing uh, bracers of giant, strength or something like that, you know, um, if you had cybernetic arms or, or something. Um, but try not to, using the, I'm using the same concepts, I'm just changing them a little bit. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the class archetypes, um, there's some, there's some of them that, that, um, that I can see being an, I can see being a natural fit. Um, there's a couple mm -hmm. others that I'm cu I'm curious as to the reasoning for why um why they were attached to that particular class. 
Um, sure. The main, the main one that I, the main one that I'm, cur- that I'm curious about on on this, just to get, just to get where your head was at, was um, demolition being a barbarian class. <laughs> yeah. Which you know, I, I guess I thought. I guess I see this big guy going in and wanting to blow something up. Um, where would you put it? I'm, I'm, I'm not. Say, I'm not saying that I. W- I'm not saying that I wouldn't. That I wouldn't put. That I um. I wouldn't put it in barbarian. It's just that it 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 conjures a hilarious image of a barbarian raging while chucking grenades at everything that moves. That's um, kind of what you know. I guess I figured it. I'm like this big guy. He's raging. He runs in. He sets this. You know these charges and he's he's just crazy because everybody's you know yo you're gonna kill yourself running in there doing that but he doesn't care because he's a barbarian Mm -hmm. he's just gonna run in and 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 do it you know i guess i just i guess i just saw yeah the 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 crazed barbarian just blowing shit up that's what i saw (laughs) it didn't it didn't help that when i saw that i immediately ended up making the joke about um the demo man from team fortress 2 (laughs) <laughs> oh so much fun but um now when it now i'm guessing when i'm guessing when it comes to when it came to the other the other one that i could see some people raising an eyebrow at, but made sense to me was the college of technology forum bards and yeah. that's simp- that and maybe your mindset was on a similar plane with this but the way i could see it is the is bards are storytellers and Mm -hmm. with story and with storytellers they get passed around um they hear rumors hearsay old wives tales and everything in between and i could see Mm -hmm. those same rumors also take also taking into effect in terms of how you're how you may or may not um be able to use given technology Grow, growing up, growing up at the t- in a pre-internet t- um, day that I did when it came to video games, there were always those false rumors about um, Easter eggs that were impossible to get unless you really knew how. Yeah. And I can kind of, that's and I can kind of draw on that to see where the College of Technology is is going with. Um, would that be apropos? Yeah, I mean. It just seemed, it just seemed natural mm-hmm. to, to have that. Uh, and I really wanted to do something with bards too. So that's why it, I, I wanted to add that there. So, well, yeah. something else aside, bar, aside from bards dying fifty times. Yeah, I know. I wanted to like. I feel like that's a, that's a forgotten class sometimes. Um. <laughs> Bards, ha- bard, I like I'd say bards. I'd say bards have gotten a fair shake in re- in recent years, but the big the big problem for me for me at least, and I think the reason why they became a why they become a punching bag for so long is the fact that they are, the fact that they're effectively a jack of many trades class in a game that does in a game that is more skewed towards designated roles. Yes. Um, but I, 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 I don't mind playing bards. I feel like a lot of people don't understand how to play one because they are a jack of all trades. That's what you're supposed to be that ace in the hole that when everybody comes up empty, you pull some sh- crazy thing out of your bag. And, you know, mm-hmm. and I guess that's what I saw with the college of technology. Like, you know, you, yeah. they study this, the technology and, and have this deep understanding of it. And so when everybody else is like, I don't know how this damn thing works, the bard's like, hey, let me see it. I can fix it, you know, or, you know, I know, or I know why it's doing that. Um, I just thought it would be an interesting level to add to that, that uh, player class. Yeah. Now, pers- personally, I think the, I think the reason people have a hard time playing bard is that they're, um, too hung up on the tr- on the troubadour look of the bard. Yes. Um. 
Because when some when somebody once asked me what what would be a good representation of a um of a bard, the thing the thing that always comes to mind to, for me is um is Varric from uh, Dragon Age. Okay. Which a lot of people a lot of people scoff at because he doesn't play an instrument, and there therein lies the problem. But Getting you don't have to play an instrument to be a bard. <laughs> maybe maybe you're on the maybe you've been on a similar page with me on this, but I've always seen the bard as the as the um live as the living avatar of I know a guy who knows a guy who knows some people. Yes, yes. You know, and I I I guess my a lot of my references come from fantasy books. Mm -hmm. And so I always thought the Wheel of Time, Tom Merlin, the Gleeman, he mm -hmm. was my bard. He didn't play an instrument, but he told stories and he knew everybody. You know what I mean? Like he was just, but he was, he never really revealed how he knew it or how he got things done. He just kind of did this stuff in the shadows. He had contacts, he had, you know, but he knew everything about everything. And I'm like, that's the bard right there, you know? He told stories in taverns, but he didn't have an instrument. You don't have to have an instrument. Oh. You could just be a scholar and tell stories or write poetry or you're just a artsy individual. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the musical arts either. You could dance. I think I had a bard one time that was a dancer. Why, why not? I, um, I did that. I did that once where I can't where. I did that once where I had a bard who was a dancer, and the sole reason I did it was because I wanted an excuse to do the cu to do Cuban Pete from the Mask, <laughs> <laughs> and and li and literally have an literally have an a a um a entire a entire host of monsters dance themselves to death. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I want to be in that campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I um I always I always I always encourage my players to come up with dumb shit, <laughs> so, and that's just one of many examples. Some of some of which ends up blowing up in their face. Other cases, um, somebody does something so stupid that I um, refuse to let it go. And if you're if you're listening to this, hi Mike, I'm still not letting go about that whole thing with the shield. <laughs> You know, you'll have to talk to Trevor because he actually he GMs the game and I play in it mm -hmm. um, and I have a druid character and I have so much fun with that character because the things that she does and the rest of the group, I think, hates it. Like I've just I've just become the crazy lady in the party because she is. I told him I I made a very chaotic character. She's not quite right in the head. And so she does very weird stuff. And they're always like, no, 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 don't do that. And I'm like. Don't metagame me. I'm totally walking up to this coffin and going to knock on it. Oh, it knocks back. <gasps> There's somebody in there, you know? <laughs> and then out comes this vampire, you know, and they're like, oh, man. It's like, so we're going to stand around and talk about it for 15 minutes, or I just go up and knock on the coffin and we get the show on the road. <laughs> um, well, put, putting aside that that, that that sort of crazy is a, lo is a long-standing motif of comedy. There's a reason the phrase... Um, comic relief is is used. Yes, yes, um, yes. He is the comic relief. Now, when I when I saw when I saw the rem, I know we talked about it early, but when I saw the remnant um, class, something that came to mind for me was the de was the debate during my fourth edition days about the vampire class. I.e., should the um, should the vampire have been a race instead of, instead of a class? Which they eventually did the strigoi, so it so, um, all, so it all evened out. But mm -hmm. was was that a um was that a debate that you were that was raging inside inside your head about the remnant about whether or not yeah because I had to I had to figure out where I was gonna put it, mm -hmm. um, because I was struggling with putting it on the page, and then to be completely honest kind of all of this that happened with Wizards of the Coast and the diversity and getting rid of race and all of that stuff got me thinking, you know, I started thinking, well, am I going to have to redo all of the stuff that I've worked on because this is all going to change now? And then I, and I was opposed to it, but then I started thinking about it in the setting and with that remnant. And I was like, you know what? 
that's actually going to work to my advantage. It's actually going to make that remnant easier to work with. Um, so I think that was the moment I was originally opposed to it. And then it just kind of, it, it kind of worked in that setting. So it made that, that remnant work a little bit easier for me. Um, cause I couldn't figure out how to do it with race because it's not really, it's not really a race and kind of like a vampire. I mean, you could have a dwarven vampire, you could have an elven vampire. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it, it is kind of that same argument really. Um, in the case of an elven vampire, that's just one more reason for me to shoot it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure some, I'm pretty sure somebody's gonna cl gonna clip me and say and say and say Mildred is racist against elves. I'm not, yeah, well, there you go. Um, <laughs> for start for starters, I played I've I played a lot of dwarves over the years, and that's play and that's play up the whole not liking elves. Second off, almost every time elves get involved, somebody ends up getting backstabbed. So, so it's a so it's a case of uh, slippery. Sh it's a case of shoot shoot the elf first and sa and save ourselves the trouble. <laughs> I also think it's a really kind of always, it's an overplayed class. Everybody wants to play an elf. There's I feel like we don't get enough people who want to play like a halfling or or dwarf or um, some of the other um, player I, classes too. The last time I played a dwarven monk, it was it was solely so an excuse to have to have him be drunk all the time. That sounds like fun. A dwarf. <laughs> A dwarven monk. Mm -hmm. Because you, he, uh, they have the uh, the fifth E has the um, the drunken master. Did you take that as the uh, archetype? Um, I wasn't I wasn't using fifth e, I wasn't using fifth edition at the time. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I was I was using fantasy craft, which is a whole of, which is a whole other can of worms. That if I was to delve into that, that that'd be a um that'd be a lecture in and of itself. But um. When it comes now, when it comes to the magic of chaos adventure, what I did find interesting about this is that un unlike a lot of campaigns that I've that I've seen over the years with fifth edition, you're going, you're planning on going all the all the way whole hog through this, like yeah, level one through level twenty. Um, I've got a lot of material. Mm -hmm. And when it when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to how these level, when it comes to how the um, adventures are set up, do you have do you have it where, um, e where each chapter is is almost like an episode? Yeah, it's kind of set up. It's set up in parts. So there's ch there's like for example, chapter one. Mm -hmm. It's basically like four mini adventures for chapter one, um, and then by the end of that, you'd be. It's basically a level per um, little mini quest i guess you call it and then by the end of chapter one all of the players should be at level four mm -hmm. so that's kind of how it's structured yeah so i'm just making sure that's the other thing whenever you're picking out your encounters and your adversaries you want to make sure that you pick enough of them that your party is going to have enough experience to be where they need to be when they need to be there mm -hmm. and math <laughs> <laughs> um Math, math, huh? Gerps would like a word with you. Yeah. <laughs> Just, I would yeah. rather I would rather take D and D's math than have to than have to break out my old ass TI eighty three to figure out how many points a vehicle is going to cost me. Hey man, I my day job is finance. Um, I do a lot of math, so. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> now what? Now. When it now, when it comes to when it comes to um, when it comes to the adventures as as they go on, do you do you ha do you have um wiggle room when it comes to when it comes to effectively side quests? Because a lot of times, whenever I do whenever I do adventures, I like to do a tiers and tent pools approach. I have a couple of like. I guess I'd call them side quests. They're kind of optional. Mm -hmm. Like, so they're kind of at the, the, the GM's discretion um, on whether it also depends on what choices the characters make too, um, whether or not they even choose to go that direction or not. I mean, if, if you, 
it always amazes me, no matter how much you plan for a game, your players will always do the exact opposite of what you've planned for. <laughs> So trying to engineer something to keep them on on task while still letting them wander occasionally can be a bit of a challenge. But there are definitely there are a few spots, and I was actually thinking about adding a couple of a couple of more um, potential kind of little side quest uh, adventures there. Mm -hmm. um, to the adventure. So um, there's still some things percolating um, in the brain to, you know, I want to push out the the best product that I can and the and the best adventure that I can um, to make uh, make everybody really like the the product. So I put a lot of thought into it and I continue to put a lot of thought into it um, as it evolves. So yeah, right now I'm kind of uh, going back through the story again and trying to add some of those things and tweak some of those things as I go and double check math and make sure that things are where they need to be when they need to be there and, and those types of things, making sure the timing is there, mm -hmm. um, making sure that the, uh, that the DM has all the tools and the knowledge that they need to be able to run uh, the successful campaign and make it enjoyable for their players at their table. I mean, that's the goal. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes when it comes to now, one, I do want to I do want to um, mention I do want to ask one thing. Getting back to the remnant for a bit, but given how given how almost given how virtually every class in fifth edition. Um, has some, has some form of subclass, even if um some even if some of the subclasses annoy me. Um, <laughs> will now I'm, I'm not asking for spoilers on this, but will the remnant have their own subclasses? I'm kind of working on those. Um, I don't have anything set in stone yet, so I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um. The way that it currently. The way it currently sits, the remnant is pretty. Um, it's pretty powerful the way that it is. I mean, I think it's a pretty cool class. I don't want to end up. Um, I don't want to make it too overpowered and give it a, a subclass. I'd be careful of that if I if I tweak it any further. Um, and it's honestly, it's kind of a jack of all trades. Because I mean, it's it's a machine. So if you can ma imagine the things that it can do, I mean, it can be a little bit barbarian because it could have a little bit of super strength. Um, it can be a little bit of thief because it could hack a computer, you know, or some technology. So I'm like, it 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 really is. It's kind of a a melting pot almost of all the classes to be completely honest. So I don't know. I haven't come up with a really solid plan for subclasses. I mean, I would like to do it because the rest of the classes have subclasses. So obviously I want to follow suit and, and, and give the remnant their own subclasses, but I haven't made any final decisions on that. So that there are no spoilers for me to give you. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I have, I have my, I have my own, I have my own guesses personally, but, um, some of that, delves into my own interpretation if somebody was to um play a remnant at my table on how on some of the things i would change um yeah one of the main ones that i i will admit might be a bit contentious for some but there is a method to my madness remnant sure i like to hear it remnants do not gain experience points n normally okay why is that being a being a um being a machine, there is a degree of um staticness to them, at least at least in my inter okay. in my interpretation with this, the way that they would gain ex the way that they would gain experience instead is through is through um is is through either is through either finding crystals or some other physical means, i.e. as they're leveling up their up their um upgrading their their um firmware. In, oh, okay. Interesting. In, the, in that regard, um, and when and when it and some and things like sub instead of giving them their own subclasses, the possibility that I'm, that I'm thinking of is give is giving them um, so is giving them some sort of copy 
I I e I e fi I e finding finding um so finding software that would mimic um te that would mimic techniques akin to class features for other classes. Oh, that would be interesting. Um. So I've done I've done that I've done that kind I've done that kind of thing where where um somebody where somebody plugs in and and um is a is able to is able to access memories that they normally wouldn't have and thus access a class feature that they normally couldn't get. So like basically downloading like in the Matrix where uh, they download uh, kung fu. Pretty pretty right? much. Yeah. I guess I was. I saw experiences more, so I was thinking AI, I guess. I'd done a mm -hmm. lot of research into machine learning. And I guess I thought the machine would actually, was smart enough to learn. And so it would actually excel in experience as it learned and move forward. But, hmm. Well. Things part, to ponder, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The, obvi <laughs> and obviously, I'm, I'm not acting like I'm the end all be all on, 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 how, to do, on how to do that kind of thing, but. The the reason why I'd focus on that is even even though even though an AI would have um would have that kind of learning, um, there's st there's still the there's still the fact that it's go that an AI is not going to learn the same way um you and I would. No. Um. And data. Yeah. It's just, it's just the it's just the it's the acquisition of data. That's why that's why I was considering a physical version of of um upgrading. Because any um like if 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 you if a remnant had an AI that was um that w that was built for um physical combat, that's what that's what it's going to going to fo going to focus on instead of a gen instead of a general sense. So another possibility is um, only only gaining XP when they are acting within their um their particular kind yeah. of com kind of programming or compulsion. It's hmm. admit admittedly so, admittedly if I'm going down that it's it's going to be a rabbit hole and I'm not sh and but and um I think by the time I'd get out I'd en I'd end up um I'd end up <laughs> all the all the way out in New Zealand or something. Well, the possibilities with that particular player class are, I mean, whenever I sat down and I was jotting ideas down and I filled up pages and, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, there's just a lot of things that, that you can do with it. And I tried to leave a lot of things. I want to leave some things open because especially with the technology, I want it to be something that the players can be creative with. You know, like yeah. you said, you like your, your players to, to come up with silly stuff. Well, I, you know, one of the things I like at my tables is whenever the players get creative. So um, it's kind of encouraging people. And especially we were talking about the archetypes. I mm -hmm. think it was the, the tinker um, archetype. That's kind of what that is. It's like, it really, it's pretty open to tinkering with technology and, you know, creating things. And there's not very many rules on actually creating technology. Um, it might take you time and you might have to do research and, you you know, it's not going to happen overnight kind of thing and things can backfire and, and happen and whatnot. Um, but really there's no limit to, you know, what they can create. Um, so leaving that kind of thing open. And of course, a, a tinker could potentially tinker with a remnant. Why couldn't they? I mean, they are a piece of machinery, so. Well, they, pro they probably could, but I'd, I'd imagine that, um, do that doing that might be risky, i.e. They, e., they end up trying to tinker and then next thing you know, they're, next thing you know, they're playing the um, noisy cricket challenge. Exactly, yeah, there's, so, and, and those types of situations, you know, are probably best mitigated uh, by the DM to keep things from, from getting too, too far out of control um, yeah. in that aspect. Um, so you don't um, decommission your, your remnant <laughs> in that way. So, um, well, we, we all know what happens when you try and jailbreak your computer. Yeah, it doesn't work out so well. So hopefully people will be cautious in that and, and, uh, I don't know. We'll just have to see. Mm -hmm. Now, you now um, 
when it came when it came to est- when it came to estimated delivery, it's list it's listed as January twenty twenty one. And now, just so I don't end up tempting the gods of irony, <laughs> um, you need a pres- jinx me on this. That that's it's called it's called reverse psychology. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. But e- even with that, is would would you say that that's the earliest time you're? Sh- earliest time you'd be shooting for when it comes to the um the digital and physical releases yeah that's probably a safe bet how what do you now obvious obviously this may end this may end up changing when when develop when development really hits the ground running but what would you say the page count is that you're shooting at um right now my estimates um are somewhere probably around 150. It's, I'd say I'd say that I'd say that's about I'd say that's about apropos, and I'm and give, given the given the size of the thing, I'm ho- I'm hoping against hope that within those 150 pages will be an index. Um, I'm gonna yeah, that'll be that'll be one of those. It's it's a running it's a running gag here in the temple because there's been a few offenders who don't put indexes in their books. <laughs> That's gonna be super fun, but yeah, um, I'm gonna do my best to put a put an index in there because yeah. Um. So with that with that with that kind of thing in in mind, and now when it com- when it comes to when it, when it comes to some of the um parts of the adventure will the will those as will um those aspects i know we said the whole episode thing but will some of those parts involve a f- involve full on dungeon delving yes there are some parts that will be um kind of like a dungeon crawl mm-hmm. there's a few of them because you've got uh, uh cities and whatnot built on all these ruins and so sometimes you have to venture down into the ruins to find um some of the things that you need mm-hmm. to get where you're going. Yeah. And I'll, I'll definitely be, lo- I'll definitely be looking forward to that and see, and um, seeing what sort seeing what, what sort of um, ritual my player, my players end up going through to try and get the favor of the dice gods. Spoiler. I know you, you do not get favor with the dice gods. Just as long as they don't bring a metal dice bag. <laughs> oh, oh, there's that. Well, there's that. All, <laughs> all, I'm, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is, um, the dice gods are a mo- are a model of equality, because it does not <laughs> it does not matter your age, profession, social status, race, racial identity, gender identity, or orientation. The dice gods hate you. Mm-hmm. And that oh, wow. and that is true equality. Uh huh. But sure is. But with the, with all that with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. Well, thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed this. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As we often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Very good. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the sh- enjoy the madness within. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>